Let's conclude our study of John chapter 12, looking at verses 44 to the end of the chapter, verse 50. John 12, verses 44 through 50 will be our text this morning. And all of this consists of words that Jesus himself spoke, beginning in verse 44, where it says, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that judgeth him uh, that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken to myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Well, let's pray. Our custom is to pray silently just for a moment. And let's try to understand what Jesus is saying in these final words of chapter 12. Father, you've instructed us that part of our worship is to include the preaching of the word. And we're about to do that now. I certainly need your help, and my flock here needs your help to understand and to apply these words of Christ. Uh, so we call upon you now to help us. We want you, Christ, to speak to us. You teach us as we sit at your feet. And may we learn, and may we grow, and may lost people be convicted and be saved in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. You've heard the phrase, the passion of Christ and it's usually meant to refer to Jesus' suffering on the cross. But all through this Gospel of John that we've been looking at, he has set forth Jesus' passion in the sense of his emotional response to various people and events. It certainly was a passionate Jesus who took a whip and drove the money changers out of the temple that we studied in John chapter 2, verses 13 to 16. And it was a passionate Jesus who stood amongst the people celebrating the, pe the Feast of the Tabernacles when he cried out, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink, as we studied in John chapter 7 and verse 37. Because of his zeal for the Father's glory and his love for sinners, Jesus was anything other than dispassionate here in his earthly ministry. And as we wind up chapter 12, we arrive at the main transition of John's gospel. Remember that the first 12 chapters are often referred to as the book of signs, uh, since Jesus prevent, present, pre presents his ministry here in terms of seven great miracles that we've looked at. Chapter 13 begins what some people call the book of passion, and it details the events leading up to the cross, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. So as we now look at the final words recorded by John before the account of the events surrounding the cross, we aren't surprised to find great passion in these words. Jesus' public teaching is now over. John says after his last appeal to the Jews back in verse 36 that we studied last week, he departed and did hide himself from them. Presumably now, Jesus withdrew to the company of his closest disciples. Maybe he's even back with his friends in Bethany at this point. But Jesus was anything but withdrawn from the drama of this occasion. In fact, it must have been heartbreaking for him at this time because the words that John wrote at the beginning of his gospel had proved true. You recall that John wrote in chapter 1 and verse 11, he came into his own, 
and his own received him not. So on the brink of this great storm that he's about to walk into, Jesus vindicates himself against those who are going to soon condemn him. At the same time, he's going to give encouragement to those who will remember these very words after the cross. Certainly John remembered them, and he recorded them in his gospel. There are only five times in the gospels where it's recorded that Jesus cried out, or that he cried. And this is one of them. Uh, two of them are found when he was suffering on the cross. Matthew 27, 46 and Mark 15, 34. Another was when the feast, or when Jesus appealed to the crowd at the Feast of the Tabernacles, calling for them to come to him as one who could give them living water, as we cited earlier in John chapter 7, verse 37. A fourth time when he, Jesus cried was when he cried out to Lazarus in the tomb, calling him back to life. He cried out, Lazarus, come forth. And now we have the fifth time here at the very end of his public ministry when Jesus responds to the Jews' final rejection of their Messiah. Here, Jesus' passionate concern is not with just the people's failure to believe, but also with the overwhelming reasons why they should have believed. Here's what he's spelling out in these final words of chapter 12. Verses 40 through 46 give us three reasons why people should believe in him and why these Jews who are about to kill him should have believed in him. And it starts with the first, he had come as God's messenger. Jesus cried. He's passionate, and he said, He that believeth on me believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. Three times in these final verses of chapter 12, Jesus refers to God as the one who sent him. And the truth has to do with both Jesus' credentials and on the honor of God who is being very offended by their unbelief. People complain in the world, even today, that, that God doesn't seem to be doing much about the great problems of the world. We have, people, we have wars and rumors of wars, and, and people are starving, and there's sickness and disease, and, and God's not doing anything about the problems of the world. But the fact is, God has sent his Son as the giver of grace with the good news of salvation, and the world rejected him. It's true that Jesus' message was surprising and sometimes confrontational. He challenged men such as the Pharisees who were relying on their supposed goodness to win their way to heaven. And he told them that is not the way you get to heaven. Jesus' coming exposed their sin. He confronted their false teaching. And of course, they didn't like that. I don't think any of us enjoy having our beliefs questioned or corrected, and none of us like to have our sin exposed, and that's exactly what Jesus did with these Pharisees. But the true question is, was Jesus speaking for God or was he not? And the answer is that he did, and the proof of that was his miracles. By giving sight to the man born blind and raising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus sufficiently proved beyond any doubt that he had come from God, and it seems clear that the Pharisees did understand this. Their rejection of Christ, then, was a rejection of the very God they pretended to believe in. Jesus not only spoke for God, but he also revealed God to us. For this second reason, he also deserved to be believed. He said in verse 45, And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. This is the Bible's answer to the greatest of all questions. What is God like? Inevitably, at some time in our lives, we all ask whether God is concerned about us. We wonder what God wants and what he has to offer us. And the answers, all the answers are found in the coming of his son. Jesus is, as Paul wrote, the image of the invisible God. 
in Colossians 1.15, so that by a sincere study of Jesus, we learn the great truths about God himself. Jesus said, and he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. The word seeth is the Greek word theoreo, from which we get our word theory, or to theorize. So Jesus didn't mean simply by looking at him we see God, even though that's true. Rather, he means that those who studiously reflect on just who he is and what he has done will then come to know God. That's what it means to see at him. We learn that God is love by seeing the love of Jesus, especially when he offers himself on the cross. We see what it means that God is holy when we see Jesus' actions, all of which were holy and undefiled. Jesus lives out God's wisdom and he displays God's saving power. John Owen, the great Puritan, said, In Christ we behold the wisdom, goodness, love, grace, mercy, and power of God all working together for the great work of our redemption and salvation. Man was designed by God in his own image. We understand that in Genesis. And this means that mankind was made to be the perfect means for God to show what he is like within this created world. You can't look at a bird and say, this is what God's like when he created birds. You can't look at a horse and say, this is what God's like. But when God created man, you could look at man and say, this is what God's like. It was because sin ruined man for this God imaging role that God sent his son into the world as the perfect man. And in this respect, Jesus not only shows us who God is, but he also reveals to us what true humanity should have been and was created to be in the first place. When we see Jesus in the Bible, not only should we say, this is what God looks like, but we should also know that this is what I was meant to be like. This is what man was created to be in the first place. Jesus reveals God by speaking and acting in perfect conformity with the character of God. And the reason Jesus can do this is that he himself is God, fully partaking of the divine nature. The true disgrace of sin is that we who were made to reveal God now need to have God revealed to us. We have lost contact with the one who made us. And so Jesus came to restore us to the knowledge of God and to reconcile us to God to the forgiveness of our sins. How great then, folks, is this tragedy of unbelief. All that is left for those who reject Jesus is a godless life of increasing darkness. But the opposite is true of faith in Christ. William Hendrickson, in his commentary, says, Knowing Christ means to know the Father. Loving Christ means loving the Father. Receiving Christ means receiving the Father. Christ and the Father are one. Jesus gave us a third reason why he should be believed, dealing with his mission in the world. Verse 46, I came, I am come, a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. That's why he came. He came to lift us out of the darkness that came upon us when we sinned in Adam that when we all sin physically and emotionally and mentally as we live our lives out, he came to lift us out of that darkness and to bring us into his marvelous light. J.C. Ryle in his commentary says, I have come into a world full of darkness and sin to be the source and center of life's, 
life, peace, holiness, happiness to mankind, so that everyone who receives and believes me may be delivered from darkness and walk in full light. That was the mission. Where in darkness, he came as light into the world. Now, when we think about these three reasons, we see why Jesus was so grieved that his own people did not receive him. He was sent by God, he revealed God, and he brought light into the world. Now, if you have not believed, will you not face the reality of just who and what Jesus is? If you have believed, then these are reasons that you need to keep pressing on in faith in spite of whatever difficulties you experience in this world. Because Jesus should and must be believed. Now, Jesus' tone here is not one of vindictive anger, but of frustration of goodwill. So he's not angry that these people are not believing in him. He's just so frustrated. He knows, however, because the result of unbelief is condemnation. And he wants these people to believe, and he can't understand why they're not, because they're going to be condemned. To believe in him is to believe the Father who sent him, and to see and understand God, and to be lifted out of darkness. But Jesus went on to say in verse 48, He that rejecteth me, and receiveth not my words, hath one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Now the purpose of Jesus' coming was not to condemn. He explained that back in verse 47. And if any man hear uh, my words and believe not, I judge him not. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. Now that statement has confused some people because there are other passages making it clear that Jesus will judge the world on the last day. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1 that Jesus shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Jesus also himself taught in Matthew 25 verses 31 to 32, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. Jesus is now not denying his role in future judgment. His point that he's making is that while rejecting him leads to condemnation, it was not for condemnation that he came. For I came not to judge the world, but to save the world, he's saying. Jesus likely specifically has the Pharisees in mind, along with the other Jews who had heard and understood his message, but still denied him. Therefore, he says that the message they rejected will judge them. He that rejects me, he says, and receiveth not my words, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Now Jesus uses the word rhema, words here, which indicates his actual words rather than just the substance of his meaning. Jesus' very words will be used in the final judgment of those who have refused him. People who have not heard the gospel will be judged for their sins, Revelation 20, 12. But those who have heard the gospel and rejected the gospel will be especially judged for the words of grace that they have turned their backs on. They will be made to remember that Jesus declared himself to be to them the light of the world as they enter in to absolute Eternal, eternal darkness that they earn because of their unbelief. His very words, I am the light of the world. I rejected that light. I heard that light. I heard that man present the gospel. I heard that missionary teach the gospel. I listened to my mother or my father present the gospel to me and I turned my back on it. There was the light 
and I turn my back because I love my sin more than the light. And now those words will haunt me for all eternity. I had the light right before me and I turned my back on it. Now we can draw some important applications from this. The first of which is that we should realize that there will be a last day as verse 48 points out. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, from the beginning to the end, the message of the Bible is that there is to be an end to the world. And that end is judgment. The Christ of God will come back into this world and he will return to judge it. The world is under judgment and it is going to perish. All that is opposed to God is going to be judged and it is going to be destroyed. There's a day coming when astonished humanity is going to hear this cry. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Revelation 14, 8. If this is true, and of course it is, then we should live with that judgment day in mind. Those who are not able to face that day should search for a Savior. You're going to be judged. You need a Savior. In which case, Jesus Christ alone can tell them some good news. He came to save a sinner like you from that judgment. He took your judgment for you on the cross, and you in faith have to believe that. You need to search for that Savior and not stop till you find him. But even those of us who have found salvation should live in the light of that great coming day. If the unbelieving world around us seems so happy and well off, we should not envy them, but remember that the end of all of that is very near for them, either through death or the coming of the Lord in judgment. They have their happy time here on earth, but that's all they have. 70 years for some of them, 80, some as much as 90. That's it. That's it. That's all their good time. Now, darkness and hellfire and brimstone forever and ever is all they have. Do not envy them a lot of the judgment. We should live for the things of heaven, for the fashion of this world passeth away, 1 Corinthians 7, 31 tells us. Second application, Jesus makes it plain that unbelievers are responsible for their rejection of his gospel. Earlier, he had taught them, back in chapter 3 and verse 19 of John's gospel. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. This means that behind unbelief is a moral cause. People want to be their own master. I'm the captain of my own soul. I want to make decisions about how I'm going to live my life. And so they reject the lordship of Christ. I'm not going to listen to this guy somebody made up and put in a fake book. I'm not going to listen to that. I'm going to do it my way, as Frank Sinatra was saying. Why else? Why else would they have crucified a man who went around healing and teaching light? Why else would people not want the holy life that Christians are called to? Unbelievers are too staunchly committed to self and sin. So even while Jesus can prove to have come from God, shines light to lift us out of darkness, people will still not bend the knee to him. And for this, they are responsible. They are responsible. Arthur Pink says, every man who hears the gospel ought to believe in Christ. And those who do, now, uh, do not will yet be punished for this unbelief. They are responsible. What more could Jesus have done? He came from God. God sent him. He brought light into the darkness. But they love their darkness. And they're responsible for that. To hear the gospel is to be responsible to God for your response. On that last day, God will vindicate Christ's gospel and hold to account those who held it in contempt. I will not have this man to rule over me. 
I will not believe this gospel. I will not trust in Christ. I do not want to live the Christian life. I want to live life my way. Jesus once said that judgment will be more bearable to pagan cities like Tyre and Sidon, which never heard the gospel, than for these Jews who rejected him. In Matthew eleven twenty one 21 through 22. The same point was made by an old Christian minister who wrote a book of instruction on Christian truth. At the end, he, asked, uh, he was asked, what would happen to one who disregarded the gospel contained in his book that he wrote? And he answered that condemnation would surely result in those who would not believe. And then he concluded, and so much the more because thou hast read this book. You read my book, it contained the gospel message, and now you have more condemnation coming your way because you rejected it. So it is for everyone who hears the teaching of Jesus' salvation. You are responsible for all of your sins, but especially rejecting the gospel that you have heard. You will not want to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and him say, you heard my words. You heard my words of grace. You heard that I was your only hope, your only savior, and you rejected me. Depart from me with the everlasting condemnation. You will do not want to be there. This is why Jesus is so passionate with these final words of chapter 12. It was the eve of Jesus' arrest and crucifixion, and his last words are meant to prove his ultimate vindication. For I have not spoken of myself, he said, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. With these words, John draws the curtain on the first half of his gospel, the book of signs. Now, people have different opinions about Jesus and the New Testament. But Jesus has asked and demanded nothing more than what God the Father has authorized him to ask and demand. Does it seem extreme for Jesus' call for faith in him as the Son of God and Savior? then realize that God has authorized him to call for such faith. Does it bother you, as it does some people, that Christianity insists that salvation come only through Jesus, as Acts 4.12 says? But this claim is made by the authority of God himself, who has provided no other Savior than his Son, Jesus Christ. Now, we Christians, we need to claim this same authority when we're speaking to the world. Too often we debate matters of truth and morality kind of according to the world's thinking. For instance, in arguing against abortion, some Christians will try to show that there might be some economic value of an increased or decreased abortion birth rate. When arguing against homosexuality, some Christians might give sociological or psychological arguments. But these arguments, even there may be some validity in some of this, they lack authority. Christians should instead speak for the word of God. That's the authority. We should unashamedly point out the teaching of the Holy Scriptures, which comes with the authority of God himself especially when presenting the gospel of salvation, the true gospel of salvation, we should avoid arguing on the basis of worldly benefits. Well, if you accept Jesus, you'll have a better life now. You'll have better family life. You know, you'll have a, a better economic life and so on and so forth. We should speak in such a way as to be able to say along with Jesus, whatsoever I speak therefore, even as the Father said unto me, in our case in his word, so I speak. We speak with that same authority. And then, even if the world rejects us, God will vindicate everything we've said on his behalf. 
you spoke the truth to these people. Second, Jesus vindicates himself by the character of his message. And I know that his commandment is everlasting life. We might say this more extensively about the whole teaching of God's word. God's word is life and it is light. To turn from our sins and seek the way of God is to set ourselves on the path of blessing that leads to everlasting life. Whether we're speaking about moral standards in general, our conduct in our marriage and in our family, our performance of duties as citizens, or our interactions with other people, God's word vindicates itself by the fruit that it bears. Therefore, Psalm 1 says of the man or woman who delights in the law of God, if you delight in the word of God, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. John 1, 3. Those are those who delight in the law of God, those who delight in the word of God. But Jesus probably here has his gospel specifically in mind. After all, what commandment especially determines eternal life? It is the command to believe on Jesus. This is not a request in Acts 16.31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That is a command. Authorized by the word of God. Earlier Jesus was asked in John 6, 28. What shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them. This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. That's what you need to do. That's what you need to do. Now we customarily speak of the gospel as an invitation from God, and, and rightly so. But it's also true, folks, that God demands that men and women receive his son. He commands that people do that. When preaching to the Athenians, Paul spoke of God's patience over the ages with rebel mankind. But with the coming of his own son, Paul said, but now God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. God commandeth all men everywhere to repent. It's a command. This is not something to be toyed with, folks. It isn't something to be put off. God is telling you. He's demanding of you. Believe my son. Trust in him alone for your salvation. God is our creator and he orders us to turn from sin and respond to him. And we do so at our eternal peril. Now, our postmodern world likes to make fun of nearly every failing of Christianity and Christians over the years. Any famous celebrity Christian who's ever failed, they love that. Anytime Christianity fails in any way, they love to talk about that. But you know what? The record still stands that the spread of Christianity has literally brought life and light and freedom throughout the world. And it does this very day. Even today. It's the Christian faith that prompts the greatest amount of charitable giving and is doing works of mercy throughout the world. Buddhism is not doing that. Judaism is not doing that. Mohammedism is not doing that. Each of us should commit to being lifesavers and peacemakers and help givers to show <coughs> God's command to bring life. And especially, especially, folks, we should spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, God's commandment that brings eternal life. You listen to his command, repent and believe the gospel, and you receive eternal life. You don't listen to his command, you receive eternal death. <coughs> Finally, Jesus vindicated himself by his obedience to the Father's will. 
Whatsoever I speak, therefore, he said, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Jesus might have said this about every aspect of his life. What he said, what he did, where he went, how he lived was always, even as the Father said unto me. Obedience to the Father was Jesus' ultimate vindication. The story is told of a virtuoso pianist performing his first concert there in Carnegie Hall in New York City. The crowd was awed by his playing, and when he was finished, they demanded an encore. Afterward, nearly the entire audience was standing, giving him a standing ovation for his great piano playing. When he was asked, go out, take your final bow, the pianist refused. And when he asked why, he, he looked between the curtains and he pointed to a small man in the balcony who was still sitting. He wasn't standing and applauding. He said, you see that one man up there? When he stands, then I'll take my bow. There's only one man, they replied. Why will you not take your bow until one man applauds? Because that one man's my teacher. <laughs> that one man is my teacher, he said. So it was with Jesus, who ultimately vindicated himself by obedience to the will of God the Father. The world might hate him, and it did. It might scoff at his teaching, and it still does, but he would be content with only the applause of one person, and that was his father. That's all he wanted. And throughout his ministry, the father gave his applause to Jesus over and over. In fact, earlier on that very day, God had audibly expressed his approval from heaven. You recall Jesus was feeling great anxiety over the cross, and he prayed, Father, glorify thy name. And the Father spoke from above in verse 28 of chapter 12, and he said, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. That was all the vindication that Jesus ever needed. That's all he needed. And the same should be true of us. If God be for us, who can be against us? Isn't that what Romans 8.31 says? Let me say it again. If God be for us, who can be against us? Who cares who's against us? What does it matter if anyone's against us, if God's for us? So let's resolve to speak and live so as to be able to say, what I have done, I have done as God has taught me in his word. I don't care what anybody else thinks about me, my beliefs, what I stand for, how I live my life, I have done it as God has taught me in his word. If we can say that, then we will not need the applause of the world and we don't have to be afraid if the world doesn't like us. We talked about that a little bit last week. People are spellbound by the world and what the world thinks and they're afraid of the world. No, we just have to think about what God thinks. And do what he says in his word. Because in the end, it will be revealed that his opinion is the only one that matters. It's the only one that matters. The opinion of God who holds eternity in his hand and gives eternal life to those who receive his beloved son. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. And so the word of God says we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of God someday. Every last one of us will stand individually before God. And there's going to be a judgment. And that judgment, did you believe my command or did you not? We talked about the separating the sheep from the goats. Goats, you did not believe. You did not trust my son. I sent my very son into the world to be light in the darkness. He came with such good news to provide eternal life. 
to anyone who would simply believe in him. And you did not. Depart from me. You deserve eternal condemnation where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth for all eternity. There'll never be a let up from your pain physically and emotionally and spiritually and psychologically for all eternity. That's what you deserve simply because you didn't obey my command. But to the, go to the sheep, they'll say, well done. I commanded you to believe the gospel. I commanded you to repent and believe. I commanded you to trust in the light that I sent into the world in the person of my son. And by the grace of God, you did. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of this eternal life where there's no more tears, there's no more sin, no sickness, no sorrow, just beauty and grandeur for all eternity. Once we've been there a thousand years, eternity has just begun. Million years. A billion years of eternity. You had 50 years on this earth, 60, 70, some of you up to 90 years. And that was it. Now you have an eternity in hell or you have an eternity in heaven. Here's the command. Believe. Repent and believe. Don't toy with this. Don't mess around with this. Today is the day of salvation. Repent. In obedience to the command of God, your creator, repent and believe the gospel. For those of us who have, it's only by the grace of God. Worship your Savior. Bow down before him. Thank him for being the kind of God that loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son to die for a sinner like you. Worship your creator. Fellowship with the one who made you, the one who loved you, the one who died for you. Let's pray. Father, Jesus was and is, is vindicated by the Father we want your word to be vindicated now. We have preached the very words of Jesus Christ. And we ask that you will take those words and use them now. Use them to convict sinners of their lost estate. Give them grace. Give them faith. Have mercy upon them and save them. And for those of us who have by your grace been saved, this amazing grace that saved wretches like us, we worship you. We thank you for this great salvation that is ours, knowing that we did not earn it. We didn't deserve it. It's all of you. And we thank you for that. And we worship the precious name of Jesus who has saved us from our sins. Now accomplish your sovereign purpose through the preaching of the word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.